Hi, I'm Danny Ramos, and welcome to this week's edition of Speak Out TV, brought to you every Tuesday night, 9.30 p.m. on Bright House Cable Network. Um, we've got a very interesting conversation that we're going to have tonight. Um, as you may be aware, uh, the organization that I belong to, which is titled Hispanic Achievers, um, had the state legislature approve the first Hispanic license plate in the United States of America last June. It was signed into law by the governor, and it was made available to all DMV tag offices in the state of Florida as of three weeks ago. Uh, the Hispanic license plate looks like this, and basically it has on it the year 1513, which is the year that Ponce de Leon actually landed on the Florida, what is what they named Florida, the peninsula. And uh, it celebrates the 500 year celebration of Hispanics landing in, in the peninsula of Florida. Also, the 16, the fifth, in 1565, St. Augustine, which was built by Hispanics, is the oldest city in the United States. Um, that plate, the Hispanic plate, is available in all DMV offices throughout the state of Florida now. Um, we have a um, situation now coming up in the state of Florida regarding another plate which is uh, pretty controversial. And we have with us uh, um, a man called John Adams. John Adams is the person that initiated um, the legal work to have the first Confederate heritage plate issued by the state of Florida. And he has been having tremendous difficulty in getting that plate through the state legislature. Um, John, welcome to Speak Out TV. Thank you, Danny. Glad to be here. Okay. So you went to court. Right. And there was a judge called Anton, mm -hmm. and he sided with you and against the state legislature. Give us some background on that. Tell us what actually, what's, what's going down. We started out uh, several years ago with a legislator who uh, sponsored our sponsored our bill, sponsored a plate. We met, we spent close to a quarter of a million dollars going through the survey process and meeting all of the DMV requirements to find 30,000 potential buyers. And we had everything ready. I wrote the legislation. It was turned over to uh, the sponsor, and it never made it even to the floor of the committee. I mean, the committee would not even hear it. Um, what we were told is a word came down from on high then through the leadership of the legislature that this bill was never to see light of day. And uh, the chairman of the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee admitted that it was never going to leave his drawer. So obviously the bill was never heard and was never passed. Um, at that point we didn't believe we could get a fair shake from the legislature so we filed a lawsuit alleging that the legislative approval uh, amounts to unfettered discretion to discriminate however they want. And uh, the DMV had, had much admitted this. Uh, in 2003, years before we ever even thought of getting a plate, the DMV was asked by that committee to produce a report on the specialty plate program. In this 38-page report, they referred to the Sons of Confederate Veterans in other states no less than four times and the lawsuits that were lost by those states over Confederate heritage plates. And the end result was that uh, the legislative uh, oversight, if you will, was deemed to be unconstitutional restriction of, of free speech. Uh, we went to court uh, last August, and uh, both the attorneys for the DMV and the uh, uh, Sons of Confederate Veterans presented the case before Judge Antoon and uh, this spring we got his ruling. Uh, essentially what he did uh, was strike the DMV's requirements completely out of the statute. They were declared unconstitutional and the state did not appeal. What, what were those requirements? Well, uh, let's see, you had to have uh, a, a scientific survey of all 67 counties showing that uh, you had a potential buyer population of 30,000. Uh, we actually over-surveyed, uh, so we wound up with probably 2,000 more respondents than we actually needed to meet that, that statistic. Um, you needed a $60,000 development fee. You had to provide uh, marketing plans, financial plans, what you were going to use the money for, I mean, everything had to be, you know, it was very expensive to do it. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you pay $4,000 for a financial analysis. And uh, you had to submit the graphics, the artwork, everything. All of that was signed off on. And uh, 
then they just simply present that to the legislature, and the legislature can do whatever they want. So, uh, when you say they can do whatever they want, they can either support it and vote it in, right, or not vote it in, right. Okay. Or they can vote in a tag and completely bypass the DMV, the deposit, all the rules, mm -hmm. everything, all of the the enumerated hurdles that one must leap. They can throw all those out, propose a tag as an amendment onto a bill right from the mm -hmm. floor, and the thing can pass just because they want it. Mm -hmm. So that gives them the unfettered discretion in the eyes of the judge and in mm -hmm. our eyes as well. Um, quite a few states are watching this because their legislation for specialty plates is modeled somewhat after Florida. So mm -hmm. I know Kentucky is keeping a close eye on what happens here. Mm -hmm. So uh, at this point we've gone back to the judge and filed a uh, request for a review of his, uh, his ruling. Uh, and if that request is granted, it will be the end of the specialty plate program until the legislature writes new legislation mm -hmm. for all of the plates, mm -hmm. even the ones that are in existence. Mm -hmm. So let's let's back up a little bit. So the, right now, what may happen is that all specialty plates may be canceled correct. when this is reviewed. That is correct. The judge's okay. ruling could. Depending well, on appeal, obviously. Uh, yeah, well, there'll probably be massive amounts of appeal because every specialty. I think there's 114 specialty plates. 20, I thought. Yeah, well, it's over 100, yeah. and and so I know that each one of them will appeal. Right. So it's well, going to be a, a huge they political issue. Appeal. They may. The only person to appeal would be the defendant, and the defendant is the Department of Motor Vehicles. Mm -hmm. uh, they really don't have a dog in this hunt mm -hmm. because they don't have the authority to issue plates anyway, unless the legislature gives it to them. Mm -hmm. So that's why they didn't appeal. They got thrown out of the process. It wasn't, they weren't doing anything wrong. The discrimination uh, comes directly from the legislature. They like to hand these plates out of candy. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, a, this is a thing, you know, give me your support or, you know, they, they look at these as their attorney said, these are things Florida wants to promote. And without saying, he apparently didn't want to promote anything to do with Florida's Confederate history. Why is that? In other words, there's got to be, you've caught a huge wave of a, of a block. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, it's a tsunami. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's no question about that. But what is it that prevents this plate from getting accepted by the state legislature? I mean, it, it's got to be something that you know. Mm -hmm. And so what is it? Well, you can love it under political correctness, but that's really not all of it. Uh, Anytime you want a bill passed or you want something from the legislature, you've got to remember as a, as a president of a PAC told me one time, the one job that they have from the day they're elected is to get reelected. Mm -hmm. So they ask themselves, well, what votes do these people bring us? In their minds, I think the legislature has marginalized the 10 generation Floridians, the people that don't represent someone that they want to Yeah, but you just uh, that's uh, there's still 30,000 people that responded to you and 30,000 30, people is nothing people is nothing to, to their campaign. To okay, but they're voters. They are voters. So that's nothing to sneeze at. I mean, you know. So uh, I but, I well, for the Hispanic plate, we we brought what a quarter of a million uh, Cubans into the state of Florida, a quarter of a million versus thirty. Well, there's, a, there's about four million Hispanics in the state of Florida right now. Okay, well, four million Hispanics is a lot more than thirty thousand. Yeah, and uh, but those were respondents that you got. That's right. Those were respondents. That doesn't that that does not equate to people who would buy the plate over thirty thousand. What you right. did was you said, okay, we got thirty thousand people that would buy this plate. So to me, I'm looking, uh, John. I'm looking for the political reason and well, the why this plate is is not flying and and you know we got to be very candid with each other well, no here matter, because no this is a real show side, you know no matter which side there is this terrible fear amongst most elected officials to be uh, in any way labeled as uh, racist or but why in other words, you, you just said a mouthful, okay? You just we said allowed, a real mouthful. Well, we allowed so, in this state, we, allowed, we in the South in general, okay, in the Southern states, because we've got 10 of these license plates in other states, and almost every state has had to fight tooth and nail to get the plate. Um, it's politically incorrect because it's basically not good for you politically to promote anything Confederate. And why? 
Well, uh, basically, uh, probably close to the late 90s, uh, essentially, PR war was declared on anything Confederate. Um, anything, the Confederate flag, anything to do with it was seen as the root of all evil. Uh, I kind of uh, liken it to what happened to cigarette smokers. Suddenly somebody decided that cigarette smoke was horrible and now all cigarette smokers are second class citizens standing out in the rain. Mm -hmm. And none of them complained about it. None of them did anything. Well, the people that kind of were, if you call them closet Confederates, stayed in the closet, mm -hmm. didn't speak up, didn't pressure their legislatures, didn't fly the flag, and didn't pay the honor to the flag that... that well, there wasn't, there wasn't an up. organizational structure, um, and it wasn't politically correct on that issue. No, but, but your mean, issue... We've your been issue, for over 100 years. I know that. I know that. Um, when you look at your plate, mm -hmm. the plate, and I'm going to say this to you because I'm a minority, okay? Okay. And um, the We're plate. A minority. <laughs> well, technically. okay, technically, <laughs> probably every group's a minority one way or another. <laughs> but when you look at the plate mm -hmm. and the historical significance of the plate, mm -hmm. there are stigmas attached to it. Okay. You know that. Yes. Or else you wouldn't be having such a big problem. No, I, would, I agree. In 1960, okay. this plate would have been. Signed without even going through the legislature. I mean, the governor himself would have presented it. Yeah, well, the Civil Rights Act, I think, went through in 67 or 68. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you have this big stigma attached to the plate because of the era that the symbol comes from. Well, because, you know. More the era that it passed through, not that it. Came okay, from. okay. So now we're looking at a symbol mm -hmm. that was during a time in history that nobody really wants to say we were responsible for that. You know, that actually took place. I understand that. I understand you know? that and that symbol is, represent, is representative of that era for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Okay? And that's why well, you're getting... Sides. And that's why you're getting, you're getting that stonewall action because, you know, the reality is you, you, we, we deal with realities, you know, and we're having a conversation here and you can tell me whatever you want, I can tell you whatever I want. You know, we're both intelligent people and I know what you've been through on this and I know you also believe in it. Mm -hmm. And I know that you've gone through a, a, a legal process for a long time. Your plate represents to some people, not to all people, a very negative part of American history. I appreciate that. And, I understand. and you understand that. Yeah. You do. Quite cognizant of it. Okay. And that's why I believe that your plate was stonewalled because we haven't shook out this whole thing yet. Right. You know what I mean? There's still a lot of people in this country who look at that symbol and say, oh my God. Mm -hmm. Okay. And there's a lot of people that look at that symbol and say, hey, that's my, my grandfather was a part of that and you know he was a good guy okay so what do you uh, you are a guy who's a leader you're obviously a leader in order to pull this off okay. you know for a particular group right if i was a guy that was anti this plate for the reasons that i've outlined what would you tell me to convince me what i mean i want to i want to know um what the feelings are of your committee and your heritage uh, committee on those issues, those civil rights issues? Well, the civil rights issues that we have at least dealt with uh, as best we could somewhat in, uh, I guess, uh, hindsight, uh, the organization as a whole has condemned uh, hate groups and, and basic any kind of racist action. Um, but I think, in my personal view, um, and I was not in the organization at the time, but the leaders of the descendants of soldiers, okay, that fought in the war between the states, should have taken a stand in the 1950s and 60s when the symbols of honorable soldiers were usurped by hate groups. I mean, you know, this, the, the battle flag, it represents the deeds of one and a half million Confederate soldiers and sailors. It doesn't represent the 20,000 Ku Klux Klansmen that happened to use it in the 60s, any more than the American flag does the Ku Klux Klan that marched through Washington, D.C. by the tens of thousands in the 1920s. It is just something that is fresh in people's minds, 
there's plenty of people around today who remember its misuse, and there's not too many people that stood up and say stop. You know, no one said stop. None of the southern people who that flag represented their ancestors bothered to do anything when I was a child. They let this go, and by letting it go, they let it fall into the wrong hands, and now we have a public relations nightmare because people are afraid of that flag. They're afraid to cherish the fact that there may be a 10th generation Floridian and that their great-great-grandfather fought with, uh, uh, you know, the Confederate troops here in Florida and defended their homes. They're afraid to talk about that because they can't explain what happened between 1865 and 1965. They have a hard time explaining that. I understand what happened and I understand why uh, people feel like they do. But I'm also constantly reminded uh, by everyday citizens of color, of, of, if you will, minority descent, that the battle flag belongs to them too. And we haven't been that good at embracing that. I was at a march in, uh, I was at a parade, a big parade in Tallahassee, the springtime Tallahassee parade a few years ago. And uh, we were not allowed to march in the parade because our flag was politically incorrect. So we set up basically a protest in front of the cameras and I had a couple of hundred people waving the flags. Family after family of African American descent came to me and asked me to follow them up the street and hand out flags to them and their children. And the comment I got over and over was, this flag belongs to us too. And that's very true. Because thousands of African Americans, thousands of Hispanic Americans gave their lives and their livelihood to defend that flag. Well, this we is... can't get that message out to the hooded knights of the 1960s, most of whom I hope are sitting somewhere in prison or are dead by now. But, you know, we talk today about valuing cultures and valuing diversity. Well, there is a diversity. That diversity existed in the Confederate Army. The Confederate forces and the Confederate people spoke dozens of different languages. I, I mean, I have a member in this division that uh, is a Sikh. <laughs> Figure so, that one out. I mean, how did Indians from, you know, Sikhs from India actually manage to get their way to the United States and serve in the Confederate Navy? It's just one of those phenomenons that you know, on the surface, everybody wants to say, okay, that flag is nothing but slavery because that's the mantra I hear. You know, it's like I said, with smokers. All they ever hear, you're going to die of cancer, you're killing me with secondhand smoke. So are you, you saying that the Confederate flag had nothing to do with slavery? No, I'm not. But the Confederate flag and the flags that are on that license plate are representative of a soldier, and of the soldiers and a government that existed at the time slavery existed. I could have very well put the American flag on there. It flew over slavery for over 300 years. Well, not 300 years, but I mean, it flew on the, over the United States. The U.S. flag flew over slavery from the time we became a nation until the end of the Civil War. The Confederate flag represented it possibly for four years. Slave trade had been banned in the South. Um, I mean, you know, I, I can't, I can't atone for the evils of the past. I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, we don't, we well, don't curse the Spanish flag because of the Spanish Inquisition yeah. any more than I think it's legitimate to curse the third national flag of the Confederacy for four years of slavery. Yeah. On, well, the visibility that people have seen. Uh, attached to the Confederate flag is what you're saying. Mm -hmm. You know, um, white supremacist groups, Nazi groups, um, groups like the KKK. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how how can you change that? Uh, what what can you do? I mean, what what you're saying in, is makes sense to a lot of people. Okay, but that doesn't change the way people feel. How did? How so how, do you, how are you going to change that? How did people change perception of... The way people change perception is they get a message out to the public. There's many things that have changed over the years in, in American culture where someone has spent some money and changed perception. Our mistake was letting someone do it for free and it wasn't anyone that we wanted, 
they, they were putting out a perception that we weren't certainly interested. And who are you talking about there? The racist hate groups, the the people who... But you can't stop them from using the flag that they want. You know, that's no, freedom of speech, too, because that's exactly what you want. You want freedom of speech. I mean, you got to understand that there was an awful lot of leaders in the South who were sympathetic to the cause of some of these racist groups. They could have done something about that flag. They were more concerned about their agenda than they were about their history. And one of the reasons that, that I designed this license plate that we've got, and uh, uh, I designed it as a history lesson. Let the flag, let the plate speak for the history behind it. I mean, I included things in the plate such as uh, the buttons, the coat buttons that were worn by Florida troops, the first state flag of the state of Florida, which uh, was commissioned in 1861. Uh, the single star flag of West Florida, which was an independent republic that once stretched to Shreveport. Um, and yes, there is a battle flag, and yes, there is a third national confederate. But the flags and the symbols that are on the plate are meant as a history lesson. It's meant as a teaching lesson. You take that plate and you teach some history, and you use the advertising and the dollars that come in behind that I mean, my organization is not about uh, any sort of political agenda. We teach history. We preserve history. Uh, how, yeah. do you, how do you preserve that? You go out and you restore a cemetery, or you restore the flags that are at the museum in Tallahassee. Uh, you pay for and commission a uh, archaeological dig. These are the kinds of things that will get you know children involved, the public involved. Um, I mean, there's probably 14,000 buried Confederates in the state of Florida, and we have been dutifully cataloging these for decades and getting you know, You know, John, I, you know, I understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. You know, I understand the heritage part. I understand all of that, and, and I can see that clearly. Um, when you have the state legislature so adversely against it, it's because they themselves, even though some of them are not black, they're not minority, what you call minorities or anything like that, but they don't want to be attached to something that flew over slavery. In other words, the economic, the economic foundation of the South was based upon slavery, was it not? Mm -hmm. Well, it was based on it was based an upon an economy that, that yeah, needed slavery to, to, to function. Operate. Yeah. To function. So the war was supporting an economic way of life. And I think that's what it's all about. That's why these guys don't want to... I understand the heritage part, and I understand what you're trying to do. I also understand, and more recently we had a, a situation with the mosque on, you know, you got freedom to do anything you want in this country, you should be able to do everything you want. But is it politically correct or ethically or morally correct to build a mosque in the shadow of the World Trade Center. Well, millions of people said no. Yeah. Millions of people said no. Now, they do have the right. That is a right. You, you are free, supposed to be free to do whatever you want in the United States. But then all of a sudden, you had this swell of anti-mosque. In in, now, I can see that, and I can be sensitive to that, because it's logically a very sensitive situation to a lot of people. With the situation that you have, I can see the logic of freedom of speech. So it's it's a paradox. It's really something that's very hard to get through. You know, as far as, you know, because of what it what people that era was such a negative era for a certain group of people, uh, because of the slavery, because of the way they were treated, and the Confederate flag flew over that effort for a time. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what you're facing. Mm -hmm. That's really what you're facing. Strangely, though, we don't face any uh, similar uh, feelings towards a British flag or any of the other European nations that... You know why? Because it, I, I think that, it's because that, it was a U.S. Than we've got. It was a U.S. It happened on our soil. You know, what happened over there, nobody cares about. And what happens here is like, it still haunts people. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's still a haunting thing for a lot of people. Well, one of the... We, ha we really have a choice. If we say this is politically incorrect, let it go to the ashes of history, then just because of basically criticism, we're dooming an entire history of an entire people, black and white, to the dustbins. It'll, you know, if we ever gave up our fight, the Sons of Confederate Veterans quit fighting to preserve what history we've got, 10 years from now, the United, the, the U.S. Civil War would never be taught.
Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's important that we understand our history, and from an historical standpoint, we're faced with a choice as descendants of these soldiers to either teach this and to defend it so that it exists, or give up and let it just evaporate like it never happened. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I don't think, uh, given the fact that I'm still holding on to relics that ancestors of mine went to battle with, uh, you know, when my wife and I were married, we cut the cake with my great-grandfather's sword. Um, these are things, you know, why should I and the 35,000 members of the Sons of Confederate Veterans and their families relinquish everything that we have been taught in an oral history that stretches back generations? Why should we just say, I'm just going to stop being this for now. I mean, it's well, never going to happen anymore. You're, it's you're, not like quitting smoking. I mean, this You're giving a compelling argument for your group. Yes. There's no question about that because of the educational smoke. aspect of it is very important for history, mm -hmm. to maintain history. Um, and we live in times where political correctness drives politics in this country. Correct. So, um, and, and that's the way it is for now, you know, that's the way it is. Um, that, makes the, that makes the reality of this a tooth and nail fight. Exactly. Where it didn't necessarily need to be a tooth and nail fight. I mean, the state of Mississippi, for instance, had a, uh, the state flag contains the battle flag of the Confederacy, and they were basically goaded or, or pressured into holding a referendum over that flag. Yes. The public relations uh, against them was was absolutely horrible. They held their referendum, and as soon as the flag won, including a reported uh, thirty percent of the Af African American population voting for it, as to re retain it as a state flag, everybody who had put the pressure on them vanished. Nobody talks about Mississippi anymore. <laughs> John, and, and with you, the plate, the problem that, that I have seen where this battle has been fought in 10 states, as soon as the plates are issued, nobody ever says another word about it again. It's no longer anything anybody cares about. It's gone. John, we've run out of time. All it's right. been really fascinating, um, it's, and, and I'd like to have you back as this thing goes on. Right. This is Danny Ramos, Speak Out TV on Bright House Cable. John, thank you very much for, you, for being here representing your organization. We'll see you next week.